Hey guys, here is a summary video that you're going to need for your first AQA physics exam covering the first few topics. Now this is just a quick summary of everything. If you want a checklist to make sure you've covered everything, loads and loads of quick fire questions, all of those important, important equations and units that you have to learn, then you can get that over in the free version guide from the website or you can get that from Amazon. The different types of energy can be remembered by using Geek's Lunch. I would admit the U doesn't stand for anything. Gravitational potential energy. Electrical energy. Elastic potential energy. Kinetic energy. Sounds energy. Light energy. Nuclear energy. Chemical energy, as in batteries or food or in heat or thermal energy. You'll notice most of these involve more than one type of energy. For example, in the phone, we have electrical energy going in, but we have chemical energy being stored, and then heat energy, because your phone gets hot, light and sound energy coming out. With the match, we have chemical energy being stored and then kinetic energy being used to strike the match and then heat, light and a bit of sound energy coming out. With the fireworks, it was stored as chemical energy and then we are going to have it transferred into kinetic energy as it moves up. As it explodes, we're going to have light, uh, heat and sound energy coming out and then gravitational potential energy as it starts to fall, kinetic energy as it falls back down. The law of conservation of energy tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is only transformed into another type of energy. Which is really cool because it tells us that the energy you're going to have for lunch or breakfast today has been around since the start of the universe. That the energy that's powering um, your computer, your phone, your lights has been around since the start of the universe. And the energy that you are using, the kinetic energy, the chemical energy that you are using today to get out of bed, to do your daily things, is going to be around till the end of the universe. Kinetic energy is equal to half times mass times velocity squared. Kinetic energy is measured in joules, half is just a number, mass is measured in kilograms and velocity is metres per second. And with this, remember, it's just the velocity that's squared, not the whole thing. Elastic potential energy is equal to half times the spring constant times extension squared. Elastic potential energy is measured in joules, half is just a number, extension is measured in metres, and the spring constant is measured in newtons per metre. Gravitational potential energy is equal to mass times gravity times height. Gravitational potential energy is measured in joules, mass is measured in in kilograms, gravitational field strength is 9.8 newtons per kilogram and height is measured in metres. Don't want to overload you with too much mass but there is a bit more coming so just take a tiny little break. Change in thermal energy is equal to mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. Change in energy is measured in joules, mass is measured in kilograms, specific heat capacity is measured in joules per kilogram space degrees C and change in temperature is measured in degrees C. Power equals energy transferred over time the units for power are watts with a capital W, energy transferred is joules with a capital J, and time is seconds with a small s. Power is equal to work done over time. Power is measured in watts, work done is measured in joules, time is measured in seconds. While energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can be wasted. 
Wasted energy is any energy that comes out of a situation that we didn't intend for it to be there. For example, in a light bulb, we have electrical energy going in. This is converted into light, heat and sound. The light is the useful energy, whereas the heat and the sound are not useful energy. They are wasted energy. And a worthy example would love to describe this if we can say that the wasted energy dissipates into the surroundings. It spreads out so much it can't be collected and used. It's not gone, it's still there, it's just spread out, it's dissipated. Heat comes off and we can detect that with an infrared camera. We can see how well the house is insulated. The blue parts, the roof, are very, very cold, so not much heat is escaping. Whereas the walls here and here are very, very hot, so lots of heat is escaping. We can see that the roof is blue and the windows are blue, suggesting they're very good insulation. New houses are built to be very energy efficient and old houses can be adapted to be very energy efficient. So we can have cavity wall insulation. Double glazing. Loft insulation. Carpets, curtains, draft excluders, if they still have them they could have a jacket around the hot water tank. Efficiency is equal to useful energy out over total energy in, and this can be um, expressed as a percentage or a decimal. Efficiency is equal to useful power out over total power in. And this can be a percentage or a decimal. When we think about generating electricity, we can either do that with a renewable source or with a finite source. A renewable source is one that isn't going to run out and we can get more of it, whereas a finite source is going to run out. Renewable sources include things like the sun, the wind, water including tidal power, hydroelectric power, wave power, geothermal power. Whereas a finite resource is going to be a fossil fuel, so coal, oil, gas or nuclear power. The advantage of solar power, the advantage of the majority of renewable resources is that they don't release carbon dioxide. We're never going to run out of them and they're generally non-polluting. The disadvantage of solar is that it doesn't happen um, during night and isn't very good on cloudy days or wintry days. It can also be expensive to install. Wind turbines, a disadvantage of wind turbines is that some people don't like them. They also don't work very well on uh, non-windy days. Tidal and wave power can be disruptive to the local environment, whereas a hydroelectric dam involves um, flooding a large area, which may include people's homes or animals' habitats. And the disadvantage of geothermal power is that it can only be used in volcanic countries. The advantage of using fossil fuels or nuclear power is that they are very, very readily available. It's a very, very cheap source of electricity, and things like coal power stations have a very short start-up time. 
The disadvantage of using coal, oil and gas is that they take millions and millions of years to create, so we are about to run out of them. They are very, very heavily polluting, so they release large amounts of carbon dioxide and other pollutants into the atmosphere, which contribute to climate change. The disadvantage of nuclear power is that you have to store the nuclear radioactive waste for long periods of time, and there is a very small, but there is a potential risk of explosion. You need to know all of these circuit symbols. I've made you handy flashcards for this, but here is a quick recap. This is a cell. This is a battery. You will notice that a battery is more than one cell put together. Here we have an ammeter, voltmeter, a lamp or a bulb, diode, an LED, light emitting diode, resistor, variable resistor, fuse, thermistor, LDR, light dependent resistor, close switch, open switch. Here we have a circuit in series where you can run your finger the whole way through from the battery to all the components. And here we have a series in parallel where it has like branches or ladders. You can't run your finger around everything without going over something twice. You'll notice here we have an ammeter that is in series and our voltmeter that has to be in parallel around the component. Charge is the value of electricity flowing through circuits. Current is the flow of electrons. Potential difference is what pushes the current around. And resistance is anything that slows down the current. Charge equals current times time. Charge is measured in coulombs. Current is measured in amps. Time is measured in seconds. Potential difference equals current times resistance. Potential difference is measured in volts. Current is measured in amps. Resistance is measured in ohms. There are three current potential difference graphs you're expected to recognise and draw. Remember current here is measured in amps and potential difference is measured in volts. A resistor at a constant temperature, the current and potential difference are directly proportional to each other. For a filament bulb, we have our graph going through zero looking like this. This is because as the temperature increases, the resistance increases. And a diode will only let current flow in one direction, so the graph looks like this, the direction that it is pointing. A thermistor is used in stuff like your central heating, and it's only going to let current flow at certain temperatures. For example, at a high temperature, our graph looks like this. Whereas at our low temperature, the graph is going to look much lower. So as the temperature changes, the resistance changes. For a light dependent resistor, whether the lights are on or off is going to depend on the quantity of lights. We can use this in street lights or security lighting. If we have a bright light, That's what our graph is going to look like. But then if the light dims, it is going to change. So that resistance flowing through the circuit changes with the amount of light. 
We can think of current as electrons moving around a circuit. And in a series circuit, they all move in the same way. They all move through the same path. So wherever we look in a series circuit, the current is going to be the same. However, in a parallel circuit, the current that comes out of the battery, all of this is going to pass the first ammeter, move down here, and then when it gets to this point, it has two choices of where to go. It can go this way past this ammeter, or down here and this way past this ammeter. So the current gets split. Potential difference measured by a voltmeter. I'm going to measure the voltmeter around the battery, then a voltmeter around each of the bulbs. And you'll notice that the um, potential difference, the voltage at the battery, is split across the components. Whereas in a parallel circuit, the potential difference that we have here across the battery is the same as we have across each of the branches. Our circuits are getting quite complicated now and we're going to be looking at resistance. When we have resistors that are in series, the total resistance is just them added together. Whereas when we have resistors that are in parallel, the total resistance is 1 over resistance or resistance number 1 plus 1 over resistance number, resistance number 2 and so on. So, current in a series circuit is going to be the same wherever you look at it, but you have to add up the different potential differences to get the total potential difference and add up the different resistances to get the total resistance. On a parallel circuit, the current on each branch is going to be equal to the total current, but the potential difference on each branch is going to be the same. To find the total resistance, you need to do 1 over the resistance on each branch. Mains electricity in the UK is 230 volts and 50 hertz. Inside a plug socket we have a fuse which has a very small bit of wire going through it. We can see from the circuit symbol for a fuse, wire going all the way through. And this wire will melt if too much current goes through it, so that's a safety feature of the plug. We have the live wire, the earth wire, which is another safety feature of the plug. The neutral wire, the pins holding them down. The cable grip, another safety feature, making sure that um, the wire doesn't go anywhere. The cable, which is doubly encased in plastic. This is encased in plastic, then this is encased in plastic. Again, another safety feature of the plug and the plastic casing, another safety feature of the plug. Power is equal to potential difference times current. Power is measured in watts, that is a capital W. Potential difference is measured in V and current is measured in amps. Power is equal to the current squared times the resistance. Power is measured in watts, capital W, current is measured in amps and resistance is measured in ohms. A lot of maths in this video so here is a quick little duckling break to refresh us for a bit more revision. Energy is equal to power times time. Energy is measured in joules, that is capital J. Power is measured in watts with a capital W and time. Seconds with a lowercase s. Energy is equal to charge times potential difference. Energy is measured in joules. Charge is measured in coulombs. And potential difference is measured in volts. The national grid is how we get um, electricity from power stations to our houses. The uh, power stations generate the electricity and they move it to a step up transformer. And then through a network of cables um, and pylons, this gets moved across the country to a step down transformer and then into our houses. Step up and step down transformers are an important part of our national grid. They work by uh, having a varying number of coils on each side, depending whether it's a step up or a step down transformer. 
a step out transformer, we turn a low voltage into a high voltage so that the um, uh, energy can move through a system, electricity can move through a system with less energy loss, making it more efficient. Whereas a step down transformer will take it from a high voltage into a low voltage so it's safe to be in our homes. Solid particles are in a fixed position. They do vibrate, but very, very slightly, and it is around a fixed position. They do not move around. Liquid particles move around much more. They're still touching each other, but they're not in a fixed position. They are moving about randomly. It's still rather limited movement. It's still within a confined space. Unlike gas, which is free to move and zip around all over the place. If we're going to be putting energy in, then we are going to be turning a um, solid into a liquid or we are going to be evaporating a liquid into a gas. If energy is coming out of the system, a gas is going to be condensing or a liquid is going to be freezing. Density is the amount of mass in a set volume. So, mass in a set volume and this is the same for the equation and the equation for this is rho I know it looks like a lowercase p but it's not it's a lowercase rho equals mass over volume the units you need to know for this mass is measured in kilograms volume is measured in meters cubed and density is measured in kilograms per meters cubed Specific heat capacity is how much energy is needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree. Our equation for that is change in energy equals mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. Specific heat capacity is going to be particular to whatever substance they're talking about and they would tell you this. I wouldn't expect them to expect you to know this. Our units for energy are joules, our units for mass kilograms, our units of change in temperature are degrees C and specific heat capacity is joules per kilogram degrees C. There is not an extra per in here, that is a space in there. Specific latent heat is how much energy is needed to change a substance from a solid to a liquid at the melting point. And remember, if a substance is pure, it will change instantly at one temperature. The equation for this is energy equals mass times specific latent heat. Our units for this are going to be joules for energy, Ma mass is going to be measured in kilograms and specific latent heat is joules per kilogram. When we're looking at the collection of molecules in a system and the amount of energy they have, we are going to have two bell-shaped curves. At low temperatures, there are going to be more molecules that have less energy and few molecules that have high energy. Now, if we say that this point here is where molecules have enough energy to evaporate, then only these ones at low temperature can evaporate. However, at high temperature, more molecules have more energy. So there are still going to be some with a low temperature, but the majority of them are now going to have a high temperature, meaning more of them are going to have passed this threshold for evaporation. And the average kinetic energy is going to be the area under the graph. So as molecules evaporate, 
they're going to be leaving this section of the graph. So evaporation is actually going to lower the average kinetic energy of a system. In this video, I'm using a simulation from the excellent FET website. You can see here we have a closed container and I'm adding in gas here and we can see the pressure. As the pressure, in, as the more gas goes in, we can see the pressure is increasing. So it's stabilised. I'm going to add in lots more gas here and you can see the pressure is going to increase. So as the gas bumps against the walls of the container, it's exerting um, a small force, it's doing work on there and is going to be increasing the pressure in the system. An atom is incredibly tiny. The word atom means uncuttable and it's so tiny that the Greeks who named it an atom thought it was the smallest thing. But it isn't the smallest thing. We know there are things inside of it. Now, I said it was incredibly tiny. Its size is 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 nanometers, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 to 5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now, inside our atom, we have protons and neutrons, and in the shells on the outside, we have electrons. This bit in the middle here, this is called a nucleus. Protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus, whereas electrons are in the outer shells. Protons have a mass of 1, neutrons have a mass of 1, and electrons are incredibly tiny. Their mass is 1 2 thousandths that of mass of a proton or a neutron. Protons have a charge of plus 1, neutrons have no overall charge, and electrons have a charge of minus 1. On the periodic table, you will see two numbers. The larger number of the two is the mass number. The smaller number of the two is the atomic number. It does not matter where these are located. Different um, books, exam boards are going to put these in different locations. It does not matter where these are located. The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons and also equal to the number of electrons in an atom. So if you want to find the number of protons, that is equal to the atomic number. Whereas if you want to find the number of neutrons, that is equal to the mass number minus the atomic number. Here we have boron. The mass number is 11. The atomic number is 5. So if you want to find the number of neutrons, that is mass minus atomic. 11 minus 5 gives us 6. Protons equal 5. Electrons equal 5. Now protons have a positive charge 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Electrons have a negative charge 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So an atom, and this is for an atom only, will have the same number of positive charges and negative charges which means there is going to be no overall charge in an atom. An iron is going to have lost or gained electrons. So, for example, if we have our, take our boron again, with our 1, 2, 3, 4, Five positive and one, two, three, four, five negative charges. If it loses an electron, it now no longer has the same number of positive and negative charges, so it's going to be charged. It has created an iron. 
here we have two isotopes of carbon. You can see they have the same atomic number, 6, but different mass numbers, which means each of them is going to have 6 protons. They are each going to have 6 electrons, but when it comes to the mass number, one of them has 12 minus 6, 6 neutrons, and one of them has 14 minus 6, 8 neutrons. An isotope is an atom that has a different number of neutrons. The model of the atom has changed a lot over time, and it's changed because we have new developments and new discoveries. From ancient Greece, where they developed the word atom, uncuttable, to Dalton, where it was a solid sphere, J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electrons, where we had a plum pudding model, a positive sphere with negative bits dotted through it, Rutherford, who did the plum pudding um, experiment and worked out that it had a solid center. Bohr, who developed um, the nuclear model of the atom. Now, I know the writing is very small on here. That's because you don't need to know the exact details. You just need to know the overall developments. Rutherford gave us the positive centre, which we call the nucleus. Chadwick added in neutrons, and then Bohr developed this nuclear model that we use today, with a positive centre and electrons orbiting outside. Rutherford wanted to test the plum pudding model, which was a large positive blob with negative bits dotted throughout it. So he took a sheet of gold foil and a gun that fired out of particles and he shot them at the um, sheet of gold foil. Now the majority of these particles went straight through. But very occasionally one would get deflected a little bit. And then even more occasionally one would get deflected a lot. And this told Rutherford that instead of it being an evenly distributed um, pattern of negative and positive charges, we are likely to have an overall build up of positive in the middle with negative charges around the outside. So the majority of the atom was made up of empty space. And this led to the development of the nuclear model of the atom. There are three types of radiation. Alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Alpha radiation is also known as a helium nuclei. Beta radiation is also known as an electron. And gamma radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's a wave. A helium nuclei and alpha radiation can be rewritten as alpha for two mass of two positive charge of um, mass of four positive charge of two an electron can be written as e mass of um, zero charge of minus one and gamma is again just a wave alpha radiation is very large whereas gamma radiation is very small Alpha radiation is highly ionising, whereas gamma radiation is not. Ionising means how good it is at knocking electrons off, so how good it is at turning something into an ion. Gamma radiation is highly penetrating, whereas alpha is not. To stop alpha radiation, a bit of paper or a bit of skin will do it. Aluminium foil or thin foil will stop beta radiation, but thick lead is needed to stop gamma radiation. A Geiger Miller tube will measure radiation. It generally clicks every time it hears a bit of radiation. And the unit for radiation is the Becquerel. Half-life is the time it takes for half the radioactive atoms to decay into something else. We can use that as a graph if we take 100% and 50%. Read across with a ruler and down. 50% cross through the ruler and down, and that there. The time between having 100% activity and 50% activity, or whatever value and half of whatever that value is, is going to be the half-life. The half-life of something can range between very quick milliseconds to thousands, hundreds of years. The calculations for this are a lot simpler than they look. Here we have uranium-238, it is going to, going to get alpha decay. Alpha is 4, 2. So we have 2, 3, 8 minus 4 gives us 2, 3, 4. 92 minus 2 gives us 90. Then we need to use the periodic table to look up what has an atomic number of 90, giving us thorium. For beta decay, we have minus beta. 
0 minus 1. 238 minus 0 gives us 238. 92 minus minus 1 gives us 93, which gives us Neptunium. It does not matter about the mass number for these calculations, the atomic number is the important thing. Different isotopes of an element are going to have different half-lives. If you are doing combined science, this is the end for you. Excellent work. Well done on making it this far. If you are doing physics, you need to keep going for just a tiny bit longer. If we want to work out the pressure in the system, that is volume times a constant. The constant you'll be told in the exam. Our units for pressure are pascals. Our units for volume are metres cubed. When we have static electricity, we have an object that isn't normally being charged becoming charged. That happens when two insulators rub together. This is caused by the movement of electrons from one thing to another thing. And you're going to get um, a shock when the charge is reset and um, when you touch something metal. If you have two charged objects coming together, they're going to repel each other. Alternatively, if you have a charged object um, and a ch an object which has the opposite charge, they're going to attract each other. You need to know all of the different sources of background radiation. Now, the majority of background radiation comes from radon gas. This is a about 50% and this picture here um, shows a beautiful scene from down in Cornwall, down in Devon because that area has a lot of radon gas going on. Then we have medical and about 14% comes from medical x-rays from different medical treatments such as x-rays or CT scans. Then we have stuff that comes up from the ground. This again is a about 14%. Then we get slightly smaller, and these are the sort of things that you really can't avoid because you do get some background radiation from food and drink, and this is about 11.5%. Moving on to slightly smaller amounts now. Cosmic radiation, radiation that we get from space, is going to be about 10%. Even smaller amounts now, from testing of nuclear weapons, it is going to be about 0.2%. From plane travel, and this obviously varies between person, because the more you travel on a plane, the more radiation you are going to be exposed to. And then the last one, we're all going to get a teeny tiny little dose from nuclear power stations. And those are your sources of background radiation. The uses of radioactive antiquity are quite varied. And what source of radioactivity you're going to use is going to depend on the half-life. And it is going to depend on the type of radiation. Gamma radiation can be used for cancer treatment and for sterilising materials because it is very good at killing cells. If it is going to be in a bit of medical equipment, we're going to need it to have a very long half-life. Beta radiation can't get very far, so it's just for things that need a short distance. For example, testing the thickness of foil that's being made or carpet, uh, cardboard that's being made. Uh, if too much beta radiation gets through, then we know it's too thin. If not enough gets through, then we know it's too thick. For this, we need a long half-life because it's within an industry. Whereas for a medical tracer, we don't want it to have a long half-life. We want it to get out of the body as quickly as possible. Alpha radiation is used in smoke alarms and this again we want it to have a long half-life. 
in nuclear fission, the breaking apart of atoms, we have a chain reaction. The first neutron is fired out of something um, and it hits our heavy, heavy um, radioactive element, whether that's uranium or plutonium, and um, it doesn't really matter for this instance. It splits it and we are going to get the example would like you to draw three neutrons coming out, some neutrons coming out, some um, radiation coming out, and some smaller atoms. The neutrons that come out can then go on and hit other nuclei. So it keeps going, and every single um, reaction releases a neutron which can go on and hit something else, which is why it's called a chain reaction. These nuclei, once they hit, they break down into smaller nuclei, release neutrons, um, and radiation. Nuclear fusion is a process that takes place in our stars. It is going to be where nuclei fuse together to make one nuclei, one large nuclei. It's going to be combined with the release of energy, whether this is going to be light, heat or sound or all three in the case of our star.